So the headline for this time together is I want to say that the aims of Jesus uh, correspond precisely to our election. Um, that the rule and reigning of God, the kingdom of God, is what has created the church. Now, I have to stop here and say before I get into this, I, I know that people from a more Anglo-Catholic perspective hear this as being, they sort of intuitively hear it as being too utilitarian um, in terms of Trinitarian theology. They hear it as, uh, it's like the accent is too much on economics and not enough on ontology. So just suspend that with me for a second um, because I don't in any way need mean to be making like an anti-Anglo-Catholic um, statement about this. One of the very first times I ever gave a talk to an Anglican crowd of people, <coughs> um, this is, you know, eight or nine years ago, we had a lunch break and I was sitting at a round table like that and um, these three young guys dressed in black cassocks, which I'm not sure I'd ever even seen anybody in a cassock before, seriously, came and sat down at my table and I want to say with humility, utter kindness and respect, alerted me to the notion for the first time that Todd, you, you know, you need to understand that a, an Anglo-Catholic sense of the church doesn't seem to have the same feel or tone of what you're talking about. And I took it serious. I thought, hey, I need to understand this. So I went and I studied the best I can a more ontological view of ecclesiology. And now, after having thought about it for eight or nine years, I now say to Anglo-Catholics, hey, look, your more ontological ecclesiology may make my point better than I'm making it. Like, if you want to argue for an ontological connection of the body to the head, well, that head had aims. And that head knew he was precisely connected to a, a narrative. That head was deeply self-conscious. So actually, a more sort of Anglo-Catholic view of this might make the point better than I'm making it. So I just want you to know that I'm, I'm not in any way trying to draw distinctions here. This is just a, a, a certain set of language that I, I think is hopefully helpful. So the church then is the community of the king or the kingdom. And as the kingdom people in this age, th that is what constitutes us as the church. So we belong to the kingdom, we live under the kingdom, and we're ruled by God's reign. And this is where, for some people, it can start sounding a little too utilitarian, so I just want to say I never mean it that way. But the church in that sense is instrumental. We're a witness to what God's doing, living under it. Can you see what I'm saying? Living under it, discipling ourselves to Jesus, that itself is a witness. It's a sign of things to come. It's a foretaste. But I say here, never utilitarian. I don't mean that. This is deeply relational, it's deeply ontological, mirroring, I would want to say, Trinitarian theology, where you have both ontological and economic aspects to it, right? So you have a being, ontological, and economic meaning, just activity. And I don't think it's helpful to pull those things too far apart, right? So like one side, you might say, pulls it apart too far one way, the other side pulls it apart too far the other way. I'm trying to hold them together in a way that gives us a sense of what it means to be the church. So in my view, seeing both the ontological connection, which I think this is what Scott McKnight, for instance, has been trying to argue for, and the instrumentality that the missional movement of the last 20 years has been arguing for, I think we have to hold these things together and that that is crucial to our daily imagination that we get up every day wondering what it means to do ministry. Because I think this then has the effect of focusing and prioritizing and keeping our ultimate loyalty clear. Now this is a deeply loving pastoral comment. Otherwise, we run the risk of just, I'm Cranmerian, I'm more orthodox, I'm pro-women, I'm anti-women in holy orders. We, if we don't have a clear thing that we're all marching towards and holding us together, the default mechanism of any institution is a sort of siloed tribalism. And I just don't think that helps anybody. So then you ask, well, what is the cohesive glue that holds an institution together? And I'm just simply suggesting if it's helpful, this telos. 
and that this telos is what gives rise to the church. So here, this is one of the places where I think Leslie Newbegin's deeply helpful when he talks in his books about the logic or purpose of election, the purpose of chosenness. And you'll know that Leslie is thinking about this uh, against the backdrop of Hinduism, him working with Hindus, and Leslie saying the number one thing they struggled with, because obviously they've got this pantheon of gods, the number one thing they struggled with was the particularity that he was associating with Jesus. Th this is what they were stumbling over. And so Leslie, from that experience, learned to articulate this, what he calls logic of election, that God chooses the one to be the means of blessing to and the bringing in of the rest. So that election is not conceived of as a special privilege, but a special responsibility to be the bearers of the blessing. So again, now just picture Jesus, his first sort of teaching moments in public. They begin with makarios. Blessed are you. Those are his first words in, in terms of, you know, sort of formal teaching. Blessed, blessed, blessed. And so Leslie's tying us to that and saying that election isn't to some sort of special privilege conceived of in this life or in eternity, but that it is also fundamentally uh, has with it a special responsibilities to bear this blessing of God that's breaking out on the earth. So here I say the church then is therefore never merely instrument. It is both means and end. And again, I think this is what the missiologists of the last generation have been trying to get at when they talk about us as a foretaste of the community of the Spirit who is already given, in Paul's language, of both sign and seal, so that we are here and now a real foretaste of heaven. So again, don't think of foretaste in utilitarian ways if that stumbles you. You can think about it in more ontological ways. Nevertheless, we are a foretaste. Like, however you arrive there, and I don't mean to say those paths are utterly unimportant. I just mean to say those paths are meant to arrive at something where we are indeed a sign of the inbreaking of the kingdom. Our lives together are indeed a foretaste of what the community of heaven will be like. And as God works through us, that's all that people mean by instrumentation. They just mean that God's working through us. So I think I said this in most of the cohorts. Just, just never allow yourself to think that we're like God's lawnmower in the shed. That is, you're right, that's way, you to tell you, way too utilitarian. We're not God's lawnmower in a shed that he gets out when he wants to work through us. We are invited into a Trinitarian reality. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Or Paul, all through his epistles, in Christo. We are in Christ. So what's fundamental is the ontological part, but it's not devoid of activity. It's not devoid of an, of an economic dimension. It, it has an activity connected to it. So we have here Matthew 5 in the message. Let me tell you why you're here. You know, this is the famous passage about salt and light. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. You're here to be light bringing out the God colors of the world. Now over to you to discern how much of that is ontological versus economic. Right? I mean, I, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I read that as, yes, there's some activity associated with this ontological connection, and that that's not a bad thing. It is, in fact, an organic thing that grows out of the connection with God. So then for me, when I come to a passage like 1 Corinthians 9, I see Paul trying to live into this election, where he says, even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I voluntarily become a servant. Where do you get that idea? Maybe John 13, as we've already talked about. I voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Whether they're religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose-living immoralists, the defeated, the moralized, whoever. Now here I want you to hear a deeply missional engagement. I didn't take on their way of life. Whatever economic activity might mean in the world, it doesn't mean taking on the world's way of life. It precisely means the opposite. I kept my bearings in the particular uniqueness of Christ. Right? That sentence means nothing if there's not a uniqueness about Christ. To keep your bearings in, some, in something assumes something that's deeply particular. So I kept my bearings in Christ. 
But I entered their world. Now, this is our work next year together. You might just even circle that little phrase. What does it mean to enter the world? That's our work next year with culture. And one of the things I want to have, I've already told Scott McKnight what I want him to teach on next year is the work he's been doing with the difference between culture and world. What Scott's concerned about is that we're losing the category of the world and that it's getting conflated with culture and we're, that we're losing the capacity to see that those are very different things. So for instance, I entered their world and then here Paul's saying, I tried to experience things from their point of view. That's for me the, the like if you just, if you said, Hunter, what's a sentence for what we want to do next year with culture engagement? That's the, that's the sentence. How do we keep our bearings in the particularness of Christ yet unflinchingly incarnate, uh, uh, loosely speaking as a metaphor there, incarnate ourselves in the world and try to experience things from current brokenness. We, look, we don't have much medieval brokenness around us. It has been a long time since I heard somebody say, no, actually I'm Pelagian and I think I can pull myself up by my moral bootstraps. It has been a long time since I heard anybody say that or even anything remote to that. No, what's happening now is, why would I want to be a Christian? I'd have to become a worse sort of human being. I have to become a hater. And I don't want to be a hater. And I don't want to be the kind of person who puts everybody else down in my rightness. So now the big question in the world is not medieval soteriology. That's a 500-year-old discussion. The discussion today is, is religion even good? Muslims are destroying the world in one way. Christians are destroying it in another. Is, the, is religion even good? Why would I want to be a religious person? See, that's a very different kind of thing that is not intuitive to most of us and we have to deeply enter that world and try to experience what it is that people are experiencing so paul says and here again i'm thinking of uh, election i become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those i meet into a god-saved life but you can see their intentionality this for paul was not religious sociology this was not an understanding of the world to write a Pew study. And I'm not down on Pew, obviously. Uh, this isn't, you know, something that Hartford might do in the, their, you know, Department of the Sociology of Religion. He's not doing that. What he's picturing is deeply entering into someone else's life. Just think of that woman at the well. It's such a classic story. And Jesus knowing that she is literally abandoned in a world that has become brutal to her. And she has no hope outside of him of escaping her present reality. This is what Paul's getting at. Paul's mirroring that sort of thing. I enter people's world. I try to experience things from their point of view. Um, where's your husband? Nicodemus, you're a teacher of the law. And, like, you're not connecting with this? See, this is Jesus entering their world. Yeah, of course. Levi, Matthew, I'll come to your house for a party. I'm entering their world, and I'm starting where they are, not where I wish they were. But I'm doing this for a very particular reason, to lead people I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this because of the gospel, the message. I didn't want to just talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. So for me, just to start, to start trying to bring this down, to try to put this in theological terms, I don't think the mission of the church is something that was discovered by, you know, Al Roxburgh or, uh, and they wouldn't say this, obviously, but, or Daryl Gooder or Frost and Hirsch or whatever. The mission of the church has always been important. It's always been a priority. And for me, I think it works something like this, and you are, you're very free to disagree with this or to find your way to mission in another way, but just for me, I think about it this way, that the categories of theology proper, like Christology, pneumatology, eschatology, they are precisely what lead us to understand what is salvation, what is sozo, and what is the inbreaking of the kingdom. We think about those things against that backdrop. That then alerts us to a sense of mission. That then, in my view, alerts us to what a sense of the church is. Now, again, this is where Anglo-Catholics would want to say it's differently, and I get it. And I'm very patient with that as long as we end up in that same place of I'm entering their world and trying to experience things from their point of view so that I can lead them into a God-saved life. Like, as long as we get there, 
I'm okay. I'm just trying to give you a bit of an imagination here. And, 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 it, and so as somebody who's tried to lead churches for 40 years, this to me is not like mere theological rhetoric because it's having that clarity of an ecclesiology that gives you any sense of being the kind of leader who could articulate a vision for your church, especially a vision that coheres to Jesus's vision of the church. I think it requires that kind of reflection. And then from that, you can understand, well, this is the values of our community. These are our priorities. These are our associated practices. This is why we pursue, for instance, spiritual transformation into Christ likeness. Those practices aren't Roman Catholic or ancient or whatever. They're fundamental practices to anybody who's trying to conform their life to the aims of Jesus. And this then gives rise to the programs in our church. It gives rise to the budgets. It sorts out our budget, our hiring practices, all that. So in my, in my view, Bosch has it right when he says, the mission of the church as the sent people of God is understood as being derived from the very nature of God. It rightly emerged from the doctrine of the Trinity, not of ecclesiology or soteriology. Mission is not, first of all, an activity of ours. It's the action of God. So now I, I want to stop and hopefully allow you guys to take a bit of a breath and see something visually that is my attempt, and you know you can tell me how, how good you think it is, but it's my attempt of saying, okay, here's what we've tried to say over these days. The big overarching umbrella idea is the gospel of the kingdom. And that has aims attached to it. We then are trying to pursue the spiritual transformation of our being into alignment, repentance, metanoia, with Jesus his gospel and his aims, we're trying to pursue that through word. That is to say, Christian leadership has an unapologetically, it's never going to go away teaching component to it. Because Christianity has content. It has a historical story. And it's got an anticipated eschaton. And all that needs explained. That so teaching the word of God is, is never going to go away from us. And I, I think it's something that has a deep, rich tradition, obviously, in Anglicanism, and something that needs to be periodically recovered. Um, because this can get minimized under any number of things. It can get minimized in kind of an over-sacramentalism. It can get um, minimized in an over-programmed approach. But I just think there's an unescapable aspect of Christianity that needs explained. And, and that is both proclaiming what's in the word and teaching it. And spirit. You know, I've gone through all of your cohorts now trying to show you how pneumato pneumatology bolts onto this story. And how when Jesus said, even as the Father sent I, that that relational reliance is mimicked in the sending of the spirit. Even as the Father sent me, so I send you he exhaled, they inhaled. I think I told you in all of your cohorts that that language is very close to the language of the table. It's the same verb where Jesus says, take, eat. It is that same verb where he said, take the spirit. And, you know, you can do this yourself. You go check out the Greek dictionaries and you'll find that that verb implies an active, faith-filled receiving. Even as we receive the Eucharist in that way, we receive the sending of the Spirit in that way. And so I think it's fundamental to everything that we want to say and do in church. And then, of course, sacrament. And virtually every one of you in this room would be better on this than I am. I'm trying my very best to get a deeper and deeper view and appreciation of sacrament and liturgy. But lots of you are way ahead of, almost all of you would be way ahead of me on this. I just want to say I think it's fundamental to what we're doing here in the inbreaking of the kingdom in our midst. And then lastly, through practices. And here I mean the basic practices of, of um, spiritual formation, whether practices of abstinence, fasting, that sort of thing, practices of engagement, study, worship, discipline, whatever, or on the abstinence side, silence and solitude, these basic practices that allow us to seek the transformation of our souls into Christ likeness, but never doing that in an abstract way, always trying to bolt it up to the gospel 
and aims of Jesus. We do this then, and the net effect of that, and now here comes back what sounds like instrumentality. The net effect of that is we become ambassadors of the kingdom. Right? So now just think of the sending passages in Luke 9, Luke 10, Matthew 10, John 20. The, the church has, a, un, again, an unavoidable sentness to it. There's a ness. There's a sentness to the church that's unavoidable. So I just want to say again, I don't care whether you bolt that on to an, an Anglo-Catholic understanding or a more Protestant understanding of it. What I wouldn't want to lose is the sentness. I just think that's fundamental to um, everything uh, we're doing here. I don't have time to tell you this story, but it, I wish I could because it, it's like literally true. The reason I'm standing here is one night, uh, Debbie and I went to Greg Laurie's church in Riverside, California. We went forward, gave ourselves to Christ. Afterwards, you know, it was just like Billy Graham. Go over in this side room and counselors would be there. And, you know, they gave us a little paperback Bible. And I went home to my apartment in West Covina and I can picture it like it was yesterday. I got out the little track that was, you know, I was supposed to look up verses that, you know, helped my assurance in faith. And, and one of the verses was 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, you know, he's a new creation. Well, I'd never really read the Bible before. So I didn't know the big numbers corresponded to chapters and the little numbers to the side of the colon were verses. I didn't know. I was just reading. And I forgot to stop reading at verse 17. I can almost never say this without crying. But I just kept reading and I read, it's as if God is imploring the world through you. You are his ambassador. Still gives me chills. I'm literally standing here today because of an imagination I got two hours old in the Lord. I literally went home from church, laid in my bed, and read that verse. There is an unavoidable sentness to this as ambassadors of the kingdom. We do this in order, now we get to the missiological language again, to announce, teach, and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, embody it in our way of being, as Jesus did, and demonstrate it in deeds of the kingdom, whether that's in the categories of justice or power. That we're, we're seeking to orient our life around the gospel according to Jesus and his aims. The way we do that is to seek spiritual transformation of our lives into Christ-likeness through word, spirit, sacrament, and practice, we then become ambassadors of the kingdom, announcing, embodying, and demonstrating the kingdom of God for the sake of others. Now, you can do all kinds of things with this. Like, for instance, you can see the great commandment in this, to love that top line with all your heart, soul, body, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You could bolt onto this Dallas Willard's vision, intention, and means. The vision of the inbreaking of the kingdom. Intending to follow. I, I, yes, Lord, I met to know what to take. Yes, I repent. I rethink my thinking. I give myself to you. I intend to do this. And then, well, what are the means? The means are word, spirit, sacrament, practice. So you can begin to overlay all kinds of stuff on this. I just want to suggest this as a kind of basic summary of what we've been doing here together. Now, what we haven't done a lot of that I want to do some now is to try to help us see this in an Anglican context. So just a few quotes here, and I don't know that we'll do them all, but just a few quotes here. So, for instance, in the spirit of Anglicanism, in order to follow its Lord, who became a servant to humanity, the church must be willing to let go of its, uh, sorry, let go of its hold upon its self-serving institutionalism. This is not easy. For churches, like all institutions, are notoriously conservative and self-protective. The inability of the church to give credible evidence of following Christ in this fundamental area is probably the greatest source of people's contempt for and disillusionment with organized religion. Now, that is not a cynic, you know, that's not a sort of barely Anglican, you know, Todd Hunter, and I mean that playfully. I mean. This is a reflection of our own tradition reflecting on itself for hundreds and hundreds of years. F.D. Maurice. We want to make sure we're not giving people the church when what they're looking for is the living God. We want people believing in God, not just assenting to doctrine of any kind. At our best, we Anglicans understand this missional impulse. 
As one Lambeth statement I've seen says, the historic episcopate, and this is another typo, should be locally adapted in its methods and the varying needs of missional contexts. So I don't mean this, even slightly, I don't feel defensive at all, but I just want you to know, I'm not saying anything new. And what I'm trying to do here is nothing new. There is nothing new under the sun. I mean, at best, this might be a recapturing of something good, but it's certainly not anything new. Hooker himself said that the church ought to be a people among the people for the sake of the people. So my little funky name for my diocese, uh, C4SO, churches for the sake of others. It's nothing new. Hooker was way ahead of me. I stumbled onto it. I stumbled onto it for this very reason. I mean, that's how I stumbled onto it. But I'm not saying anything new. Paul Avis describes the early period of Anglicanism as an apostolic community spearheaded by missionary bishops. And further, that there's an acknowledgement that the faith of the church, as the Church of England has received it, needs to be expressed afresh in each generation. Now again, I don't mean anything controversial by this, but you just have to ask yourself, how does a church for whom her deepest self-consciousness is historic, how does that church do this? And this is what I said when I stood in front of you. This is what I meant when I stood in front of you on Thursday. This alone will take everything we have. It will take our deepest intellect, our truest faith, to even just sort out the minimumness of the goodness and rightness of continuity versus discontinuity. Every institution struggles with that. When John Wimber died, and I was the, the leader of the vineyard, the very first impulse was to define, defend, and protect what John had taught. And though John was like a father to me, and I was like a son to him, I had the job to say, everything to be known about Christianity was not revealed to John. What was revealed to John was a slice of the kingdom of God and pneumatology. It revolutionized, for instance, the Church of England. I mean, you go to England and they talk about, uh, I just went out of my head. Uh, <laughs> never mind. They talk about Wimber as like a saint. Now, all through the Church of England, of all kinds of categories, Wimber is a saint. They put him on the map because he had this insight to like one little slice. But I had to say to the vineyard, who you'd think of as the least institutional church in the world, I had to say to them, we are facing at this transition from a founder to the second guy, a deeply intuitive social psychology of to circle the wagons, define, defend, and protect. And I just knew in my guts that that is anti every missional impulse that says, no, I entered the new world, the existing world. I became a servant to all kinds of people, not just 70s charismatic renewal. But how do we make ourselves present to 2017 problems? That immediately draws into question, to what degree do we do that in continuity with this deep and important history? And to what degree do we need to just reshape a little bit? And what these Anglican missiologists are saying is every institution reacts against that shaping. Here's why. It's not that they're bad people. They're not stupid people. It's got nothing to do with that. They react to it because change, look at my hand, changing the shape of, a, of an institution feels disloyal to what it was. See, if I do this, that's not innovation in some deeply social psychological ways, that is disloyalty. It's supposed to be this. It cannot be that. And this gets right to the heart of any sort of leadership in a small group, a church, a denomination, whatever. Sorting that out in a way that feels true and good and righteous and fruitful is deeply at the heart of any kind of missional leadership. Paul Avis, we should not fret about the identity of Anglicanism. Uh, this is so wise, I think. Pursue integrity. In, in my words, pursue alignment with the purposes of God for the church, and identity will take care of itself. That whatever new form that institution may take, if we align ourselves to the gospel of Jesus and his aims, whatever shape that institution takes will be righteous, good, and fruitful. And it only becomes that 
by being indexed to this telos I've been telling you about. When it's indexed to either contemporary controversies or historic controversies, that's when it shapes changes in not so good ways. So change is neither good or bad. Change raises the question, to what is that change indexed? What's the purpose that underlies it? And what's its tell us? That's what makes change good or bad. So now turning a, a corner bit here and just begin to work with Jesus' statements uh, to his first friends in John 20, where, you know, he's, those famous words, receive the Holy Spirit, take, receive the Holy Spirit, and then these great words that, again, is what brings up into normal people at least something of instrumentality. As the Father has sent me, so I also send you. And, but I just want to say here that if you struggle with that, think of it as relational reliance. Don't think of it as a lawnmower in the shed. That's a very different thing. But if you think of it as relational reliance, as Jesus said many times, um, I'm telling you here this straight, the son can't independently, so now there you hear ontology. The son can't independently do a thing. He can only do what he sees the father doing. What the father does, the son does. For the father loves the son. And here, there again you hear relationality and ontology. For the father loves the son, and here you hear instrumentality, includes him in everything he is what? Doing. So please stop thinking of Protestants as being utilitarian and Anglo-Catholics as being ontological. It's a false dualism that will hinder our missiology. These things work together, necessarily. A relational activity that the Trinity was doing together and that we're now doing together with them. So then this pattern, I think, alerts us, and I can't think of who this was. I forgot to footnote it. Maybe it's Bosch or it's, it's somebody smarter than me. Uh, who said that the whole Trinity is a missionary God. Maybe David remembers where this comes from. So that we see the Father is the missionary first person of the Trinity, the Son is the missionary second person of the Trinity, and the Spirit is the third missionary person of the Trinity. So when we hear Jesus' words, as the Father sent me, so I send you, that of course raises the question, well, how did the Father send Jesus? Uh, to what was Jesus conscious when he said that? What were his aims in saying it? And again, we have, I only do and say as I hear my Father saying and doing. And so the question I want to ask is fundamental to this tell us um, uh, collected is, what would it be like if we chose to be Jesus' apprentice and to lead our ministries in that way? Now you see how that sucks up into it. Gospel, culture. What does it mean to be ecclesia? What does it mean to be the church? What does it mean to be a missional leader? How do we engage in this relational reliance with the third person of the Trinity? How do we apprentice ourselves to this big story that's still up there? Well, you know, I've said word, spirit, sacrament, practice, but, you know, like deeper than that, how do we give ourselves to this? And I love the way Jesus summarizes his, um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I lost myself here. Oh, what would it be like? Yeah, yeah. What would it be like if we chose to do this? And I just is one of my very, as you can tell, I, I like the message. If for nothing else, it's fresh. Um, but the, the top of page six, this is maybe my favorite passage in all the message. Because you remember, this is Matthew 11, the context. Jesus has been doing great works and, and teaching great things. And some of the cities are coming to him and some of the cities aren't. He begins to pronounce woe uh, over those cities. But then he turns and begins to talk to his first friends. And again, explaining himself, he says, the Father's given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father-son operation, and there you, that's Eugene's trying to get at the ontological connection again. I, I sometimes say that that hyphen is the most important hyphen in all of English literature. Probably not true, but you get what I'm saying. Like, you just pour ontology all you want to pour into that little hyphen. This is father-son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the Son the way the Father does, nor the Father the way the Son does. But Jesus here, I'm not keeping it to myself. What we had going on in the family business of the Holy Trinity, like picture that as just like a bakery. I'm inviting you into the bakery. You get to come help us make bread. 
you even get to have a little hand in the recipe sometimes as you enter the world and try to experience things from people's point of view. The Spirit will be right with you there helping you create a recipe for that moment. I'm not keeping it myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. You know, that's that famous uh, phrase that we've already talked about, anybody who has ears to hear. So anybody who's not willing to, anybody who's willing to go beyond filtering me through their present worldview, I'm willing to go over what I'm doing with my father line by line with anyone willing to listen. Now these next questions imply that there's a way of being religious that makes you tired, worn out, and burned out. Jesus knows he's looking precisely at crowds of people who through their religion, are you hearing me here? Not just through the abuses of the world, as important as they are, but precisely through their religion, he says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Apprentice yourself to me through word, spirit, sacrament, practice. Get away with me and you'll recover your life, which is to say you are not presently living human lives as God intended. You're living something that is subhuman or distortedly human. But if you come follow me, you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. So come walk with me, apprentice yourself to me, walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. And these are probably my favorite six words in all the message. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Because that is fundamental to father and son intimacies. Whatever economic means in the second person of the Trinity, it does not mean meritorious or earning or showing even before Jesus said it, before Jesus ever said or did a thing, he came up out of the water, the Spirit descended on him, and he heard his Father say, this is my Son, with whom I am well pleased. See, that comes out of eternity in the Trinity. His career hasn't started yet. And then, listen to him. Apprentice yourself to him. Make him your master. I think I said the other day, as a minister of Christ, you will never make a more fundamental decision than this. From whom are you learning to do life and ministry? Once you answer that question and take on your teacher's teachings, you will be heading towards a telos, unavoidably. Because a teacher and a teaching heads towards a telos. And here, the great invitation of Jesus is come walk with me, learning the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. And as I did with my Father in the Trinity, you will learn to live freely and lightly. And so here now, drilling down a little bit more to mission, it's not just religion that beats people up, but the increasing brutality of human existence in general brings to the forefront, I want to say, the practical power and goodness of obedience to Jesus, and especially of his wise and authoritative teachings and alignment to his aims. I say here sort of playfully, just when we think that Jesus' worldview is naive or impossible, as I said yesterday, he calls us to a clear response. These teachings of the Sermon on the Mount are not incidental additions to your life. They're not homeowner improvements to democratic capitalism. They're not something human beings get to use for their ends whether a rejection of a religion or the co-opting of religion to be chaplains to a, a system that really doesn't want to have much to do with God at all. But we're continually reduced there. I remember reading Missional Church, the sentence that I'll never forget, I think came from Hunsberger, that we are vendors of religious goods and services. I will never forget that phrase as long as I live. And I didn't even come up, came out of, I come out of the evangelical world where you would have thought we were a little bit free of that. Meaning, you know, we weren't, what's the phrase, hatching, matching, dispatching. You know, we weren't, we weren't doing that sort of thing, which is a big part of what those missiologists in that generation were getting at. But nevertheless, in the evangelical world, we had our kind of, we, we were letting the terms be dictated to us so that where the culture would allow us to vend to them things that they wanted to consume, well, then that created space in our culture for us to be. And George and his colleagues were trying to say, no, that's actually not who we are. Our being isn't defined by the culture. It's defined by something that, that transcends that. So these aren't homeowner improvements to your current way of living. They're foundational words. Uh, again, uh, read into that word pre-creation divine intentionality. 
These are, pr pr these are foundational words, words to build a life on that heads towards a telos. And if you work these words into your actual life as an apprentice of Jesus, you're like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. But Jesus said, if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you're like a house built on a sandy beach. Or Jesus said, many will say to me, Lord, and never do the things I teach. Now, I got to say, as a teenager and as a young evangelical evangelist, I think I read that as a scary threat. And I don't know. Maybe there's a little threat in there. You know, it's very hard to do exegesis leading between the lines. But I'm not sure this was meant to be a scary threat, at least only. I think to paraphrase, what you have going there is something like this. Lots of people give honest mental assent to my being. But they have no intention of placing their confidence in my explanation of ultimate reality. Nope, you slap me and you're getting slapped back. I enjoy a good fight. What do you mean I can't lust? I just have these feelings of heterosexual or homosexual or anything in between feelings. And to be human means to fulfill my desires. So what do you mean, gee, I can't cultivate lust? See, there's a lot of people who are willing to give sort of amorphous intellectual assent to maybe some historic person named Jesus, but they have no intention of following his teachings. They have no intention of getting on the path towards which his aims are pointing. They co-opt him for whatever it is they got going on in their own life. No intention of placing a confidence in my explanation of ultimate reality. They cannot bring themselves to trust it. And now we're just right back to, you know, I don't know how we made such a hero out of James K. Smith, but we're right back into what Jamie's trying to do here. They, they just, there's, there's, there's a set of desires in them that forbids them from actually coming to trust what Jesus is teaching. All right turning our last corner to something that I hope will be just kind of a final commission for our work together and our friendship over the years is to say that a core aspect of discipleship in my view is discovering whatever it is in our actual belief system not what we think or should believe or think we should believe but what is it in our actual belief system that makes confidence in Jesus and his gospel and his aims seem hard or impractical so as we leave here today, I told you when we started that I've been here with you the last couple days as much as an evangelist as a teacher. And I actually am asking you and everyone who wants to be in this to make a decision. Are you glad that God has a rule and a reign? How does that make you feel? Just, just on an existential feeling level, are you glad that there is a God who has a rule and a reign? Or to quote Jesus, does that reality seem to you like a treasure buried in a field of such value that you would leverage all your other assets to hook your life up to that rule and that reign and its aims? Does it seem to you like an ambition that would come to preoccupy your mind and thus change the whole direction of your life? Switching analogies as Jesus did. Does it seem to you like the pearl of greatest price such that you would sell all you have to get it. Because I think this is the real deal. That the perspective from which Jesus taught stretches from pre-creation, I should have said here, outward to the whole cosmos and to the whole of human history. And from that vantage point, he tells us we have no need to be anxious about anything. For there is a divine life. There is a rule and reign that's available to us as the true home of the human soul. And that as we enter this realm, and we can do because of the grace of God in Jesus, we can now enter this realm, we can enter into the heart of God by simply placing our confidence in him, choosing to be his friend and following him, and that in so doing, we can be renewed from the depths of our souls out for the sake of others. And we're right back to that little diagram of mine. So I'm actually asking you this afternoon, 
from the deepest level of motivation and understanding that you have. I am actually asking you to make a decision to recommit to placing your whole confidence and trust in Jesus and to follow him into the reality of the kingdom of God as he taught it. Will you do it? Will you place your trust in Jesus? Will you rely upon him and follow him? Will you bet your life and ministry on Jesus and God's kingdom? And will you become an apprentice in kingdom living? Only as we do can we pass that on to anybody else.